So the FBH just put out their minimum size guidelines for enclosure size in the hobby. Now this has caused a bit of controversy. Some people are really for it. Some people are really against it. Um, it's very interesting. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to go look at the document. We're going to explain what the FBH is and what the FBH does. What this document is for and why it was come about in the first place. And then we're going to get Tarek Abuzar who is the exotic veterinarian who worked on the document to come on and give us a little bit of information about what this is and why and if we should support it. Let's just go over what the FBH is. The FBH is the Federation of British Herpetologists. Now what this is, it's an umbrella organisation in the UK which represents all the local reptile societies to fight misinformation and anti-pet keeping campaigns by groups like Peter and things like that. So what we're going to do, we're going to open up this document and we're going to have a look. Let me just read the objective of this document to you. So this document underpins the good practice guidelines for the welfare of privately kept reptiles in the UK. It aims to promote the physical health and psychological well-being for the reptile by stating a set of guidelines for minimum enclosure size in which a reptile has the opportunity to engage in normal behaviours, such as locomotion, basking and hiding. It does not, however, apply to commercial activities involving reptiles which are regulated by licensing. So, how this is going to work when you read this document? When it says the minimum enclosure size, width, by depth, by height, it's not saying, for example, this gecko group, includes leopard geckos, it's saying a 6x3x3. By three by three. That's not saying a 6x3x3x3 three by three by vivarium. That is saying 6 times the snout to vent length. So that's the snout measurement to the vent or the cloaca of the leopard gecko. So in the Clubridae part, uh, the Lampopeltis section is of particular interest to me. So there's a summary here and it says a 0 0.9 times 0 0.4 times 0.3 tail to length so the snakes aren't snout to vent they're t the full length of the snake so that's the difference between the snakes and the lizards here um just keep that in mind or they're saying alternatively we could consider the dimensions of 1 by 0.3 by 0.3 which would lead to a minimum enclosure size of 4 by 15 by 15 now i'm already exceeding this minimum because i've got them in a, a 4 by 22 by 22 so just short of two foot. Okay, for this for the snakes, this overall text bit here, I would like to cover. These guidelines for minimum enclosure size relate to an enclosure housing a single adult snake or a snake that's more than 18 months old. Enclosure size of snakes are based on the total length of the animal and the dimensions are multiplies and the dimensions are multiples of the animal's length. For terrestrial species, the minimum enclosure size should generally have the longest dimensions illustrated in the table as the width. For truly arboreal species, identified as requiring climbing space, it may be suitable for the longest dimensions to be the height rather than the width. The FBH has commented on rack systems for snakes. Suitable environments can be provided in rack systems, i.e. those which adhere to minimum floor size as per this document that provide a sufficient light cycle, thermal gradient, and other environmental stimuli to allow the animal to display natural behavior. Rack systems can also have a practical purpose for short-term and unenriched housing, which should generally be limited to three months. For example, keeping an animal sterile in quarantine or for medical reasons, for periods of brumation, and as practical housing for young or baby animals, while they become established. What this means is if you work out the floor spaces as per the document, obviously you're, you're disregarding the height. So if you had a rack that was 0 0.9 times the length and then 0 0.45 times the width of the snake. So for bearded dragons, we're looking at six times the snout, snout to vent length by three times the snout to vent length, by three times the snout to vent length. So my bearded dragon snout, I've got a really, Nugget's quite a, a small girl. So she is 20 centimeters. So basically the minimum's there is still, for my bearded dragon, my little tiny 20 centimeter bearded dragon, the minimum standards there are four by two by two. 
So I'm meeting the minimum standards for this particular bearded dragon because she's small and a 4x2x2. Two two. Let's talk to Tarek and let's ask Tarek what's going on with this document. Thank you very much for giving us your time. Um, I think this document has basically caused a little bit of controversy depending on who you ask or it's completely amazing depending on who you ask. So the first question I wanted to ask you is, is what is the purpose of this document? It's been created because there aren't currently any guidelines that are accepted for private keepers. There obviously are for commercial keepers in the form of AAL, but we have no agreed standard. Obviously, we have lots of books, lots of care sheets online, lots of different Facebook groups that have their own opinions on things. And the trouble is a lot of that information is very, very different um, and wide ranging. And there's a huge disparity in what, you know, different people recommend. I think ultimately for me, the reason for having this document is to come up with some sort of a recommended guidance for private keepers. So they sort of know considering best practice, what an acceptable minimum standard would be in the eyes of advanced keepers, vets, and and different stakeholders. Um, so I think it's I think it's to, to give guidance. I'm also aware that politically there is a move to try and put more specific guidance out there. And I think I think the for me the best idea really is for the hobby actually to get in there first and to come up with some evidence-based guidance that can be justified scientifically um, for people to follow. And ultimately, I think that will be a positive thing for the hobby. And also, I think, you know, most important thing is regardless of who's keeping these animals and why we keep them and 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 everything else i, I think i think it's i think ultimately the, the reason is is animal welfare isn't it you know we're doing this to try and improve the standard of reptile welfare and set a decent precedent and we want people to think about standards and consider all of the different areas that come into deciding what a minimum standard is as in we want the animals to have a sufficient amount of space and be able to display their normal behaviors we don't want a document that's so unbelievably rigorous that it is essentially designed to end the hobby of reptile keeping um you know and 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 so i think i i personally and everybody's entitled to their opinion and i'm not in any sort of an official capacity here i'm not actually an elected member of the FBH. I mean, I've voluntarily given them time and input and advice. And obviously I have a unique perspective because I'm a keeper and I'm a specialist exotic vet. Um, in my opinion, I think this document is just right. And there might be one or two things that in time we need to change. And I think particularly if there are valid scientific arguments, you know, it says in the document that this is an evolving document and there's an email address that you can provide feedback to. Mm -hmm. So it may well change, obviously, you know, for all of the people that endorsed it to keep endorsing it, they all have to agree to, to any changes. Um, but I think, yeah, I think ultimately it's to set a standard for private keeping because there isn't one. And it's designed for the hobby itself to set that standard and to self-police itself to some extent. And it's designed to be a balance between what is an acceptable minimum for animal welfare and what is actually doable for private keepers. And I think, I think it's a much needed document. So I was speaking to Sid and Dave Hayden yesterday and they've told me that both the veterinary associations have backed the document. What does this actually mean and what does this mean for us keepers? whatever you think of the veterinary profession, um, in, they will be involved and they will have a big say in any kind of legislation or guidance. And the fact that you've got the vets on board saying, actually, yeah, you've, you've come up with a sensible document here, um, I think, I think is, is hugely beneficial. Now, I, I kind of feel a bit stuck in the middle here. Um, and I've, I've, I've been criticised and I've seen the document be criticised 
by both ends of the spectrum. Right. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism from keepers, um, particularly not on the whole. I think actually the reptile keeping community has been um, really accepting. I think, um, and I think a lot of people can see the benefits and a lot of people can see the scientific arguments. There are a minority of keepers who, who don't um, and who think that this is a move to help the antis um, to try and ban the hobby. And yeah, and, and, and those keepers tend to be um, the keepers that are keeping a lot of snakes in very small boxes. Um, so there's been a lot of criticism from that end. Uh, and then there also has been a lot of criticism from the other end as well. You know, um, a lot of people in the veterinary profession can't understand why the document wouldn't go to one times the length for a snake, for example. Right. Uh, of course, it doesn't. At the moment, it says they must stretch in one dimension. Um but you know, 0.9 is acceptable, or 0.8, or 0.7, depending on the width then of the enclosure. It, it, it's all it's all very it's all very technical, and perhaps we can talk about that in a bit more now. Yeah, in terms of, yeah. But, I think people but, are confused yeah, by that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been there's been lots of criticism from both ends, and I sort of feel like that gives you an indication that you do have a sort of sensible middle ground, hopefully. Um. And, and, and it's more justification for me that actually probably this document is just about right. I would hate to have a document where all the reptile keepers were completely pleased with it. And I would hate to have a document where all the animal welfareists, you know, and a lot of sort of non, non people in the know in the veterinary profession were super happy with it as well. I think, I think this is just about right. Um, and, and on the bell curve, this is somewhere in the middle, which I think is where we need to be. In terms of the 0.9 instead of the 1, what does that actually mean? Is it so that there's still, if it's 0.9, that is still the length of the snake on a diagonal? Well, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because the, the whole point is that it's not just about the length of the enclosure. Ultimately, it's about space. And you can have an enclosure that is slightly less long, but much wider or much taller that actually gives the animal a lot more space so for example if you had a five foot by 18 inch by 18 inch vivarium that would be much smaller than a four foot by four foot by four foot vivarium does that make sense when you yep. consider the volume and also the the surface area there so for a four and a half foot corn snake, what is better? The, the one that's slightly less long, but still pretty much as long, but that has much more area and volume or the much smaller enclosure, which is as long as the snake. You have to consider all of the different dimensions. But what, what can be shown scientifically is that well, firstly, snakes, there's, there's no science I'm aware of that shows that snakes readily adopt a completely linear, completely like a prong ramrod posture regularly. Yeah. And that fits with my own experience as a snake keeper. Very, you know, you'll see them near enough. It's always out. near enough, but not near like, enough. Yeah. But actually completely 100%. And you know, that's an argument against having a one times length. And I think that's a valid argument. There is no science to say that that isn't the case. There is science to say that snakes do loosely coil or adopt near, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent um, rectilinear or stretched out postures regularly when they are given the opportunity to do so. And so if that's what the science shows, what you say then is, well, let's have an enclosure that's 70 or 80 or 90 percent, depending on the width. So it's so the document says 0.9 times 0.45 or 0.8 times 0.6. So the width is bigger to compensate for the slightly less length or 0.7 by 0.7. So these are all these all give a Pythagorean. So an internal diagonal, which is one. 
So the right. different, different different ways of having the enclosure to, to end up with that long diagonal being one times the length of the snake. And actually, if the snake does have the ability somewhere in the viv to stretch out 100%, although it's very unlikely to do that very often, if, if, if ever. Yeah. And then everywhere else in the viv, it can pretty much comfortably near enough stretch out. We decided that scientifically, that's where we could justify being. 